Praise the Lord, everyone. <clears throat> Just thought I'd get on here a little bit early and let people sign in and and uh, before I share with the, with everyone. <clears throat> Give me while I get a, just a little cup of coffee or drink of coffee before everyone gets on. Hi, Sister Ruth and Sister Sandra. Praise the Lord. Well, <clears throat> it's good to uh, get back online with everyone and <clears throat> uh, most of you in, in our church here in Little Rock know that we're right now just having Sunday services at 1130. Uh, we're just going to look at it each week and see where we're at and when to start our Wednesday night services. Uh, so we'll be letting you know, <clears throat> but at, at least until then, we will continue to the uh, Thursday night at 7 o'clock. Um, I'm working on and and I'm right at the brink of having it developed to uh, be able to, uh, for the Dominic, people in the Dominican Republic to be able to um, have Brother Green um, on with me and he will interpret for the people in Spanish, uh, in Spanish and uh, it, will, it will post to Facebook and as well as our website and YouTube, I believe. That will be at a different time for the Dominican people. Anyone that wants to can listen to it. Uh, you know, we can give them an invite into uh, the live stream, but I'm doing that primarily for the, for the uh, people in the Dominican Republic. Um, so, but we'll continue this Thursday night broadcast for, for a while and see where we where it goes. Anyway, God bless you all. It's, uh, it's good to be back on the air again. And uh, I'm thankful that we are have been released to have services in our church. Our first service was this past Sunday and, and I was thankful for that and thankful to see everyone. Uh, God bless you all. Uh, I do wanna mention Brother Chuck Millsap in Wichita, Kansas, passed away today, and uh, our heart goes out to Sister Bernice and Brother Sister Green and uh, Sister Brother Millsap's family, uh, all the saints there in Wichita. And Brother Millsap was a he was a wonderful man and a great great help and elder to Brother Green in the church there in Wichita. He will be greatly be missed. But we have every confidence that we'll see him again in the resurrection. And, and uh, he was a faithful uh, man and just in every way that I know. And so um, I feel blessed to have him known him and his, his precious wife. Our prayers goes out to the family our, for their comfort, for God's help during this time of adjustment and uh, our prayers will remain with you. Um, anyway, it's just good to be here tonight with y'all. Uh, I think I might say something, you know, we finished our last broadcast, uh, finishing up with the seven vials of the last seven last plagues and going through the succession of uh, prophetical events that would need to uh, or that were yet to take place. Um, I apologize for, uh, you know, my uh, allergy. I, this time of year, pollen is so high and I have allergies and so it caused me to sniffle some and I, I, I do it without even hardly thinking, but on the other hand, I don't know if I can almost stop it. But please forgive me for, for that. 
Uh, hopefully the Lord will help me get over that soon. Anyway, we're thankful that no one, you know, in our church has had uh, this coronavirus and uh, to date, and so appreciate God's hand on us and those who, you know, that we do know that have had it, uh, where our prayers have continually been with them. Anyway, uh, uh, tonight I'm. Uh, I think I'll say a little bit about uh, why it's necessary to overcome sin. <laughs> Maybe, you know, mention some things that, uh, in explanation a little bit. I know that, <clears throat> you know, many of you elders and theologians have a, are fairly well versed in this subject. However, there's you can always hear something from somebody that, you know, maybe has a little bit of a different way of explaining things or brings in a different thought on it that will help you. I know every subject I talk on, the more I talk on it, the, the better I understand it and the more settled I am on, on it. And so, uh, just in, in, in talking about why it's necessary to overcome. Um, number one, uh, it's imperative to understand that, uh, that Adam, when Adam fell, you know, God, God made Adam in the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden is a type of of the divine order of God. There was no sin there. Uh, and Adam had the knowledge not to sin. He, he had a full knowledge of, and operation of God. The Lord walked with him in the cool of the day. Uh, I think it's important to understand that God the Father, you know, created Jesus and Jesus created uh everything else that was created. God wanted him to have preeminence. And so he's the creator. And uh, he was in, in most places, the God of the New Testament. Although the father did show up a few times and, and his manifestation was always there. I've always mentioned in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews that uh, where it mentions the seven spirits of God, that one of those spirits is the spirit of the Lord, which is the spirit of God the Father. Um, then, then the spirit of wisdom, which was, that was Jesus. He was the wisdom of God. He was made wisdom for you and I. He was God's mouthpiece, God's mindset uh, over all of God's work. He's the head of the body. He's the, somebody said he's the brains of the outfit. <laughs> the Clyde Pat used to make that statement quite often. He was just an old country boy. I came up in the country, so that, that rung a good bell with me. I still make that statement a lot. Jesus is the brains of this outfit. Anyway, um, uh, but when in, in Adam was in a garden, he was in a, in, the Garden of Eden, which is paradise. Paradise is a type of the second heaven condition that the early church was in that we're laboring right now in restoring the church. When the church is restored, it will be, uh, it will be paradise. Uh, I'll give you a scripture. If you'll look with me in uh, the book of Joel, the little prophet. Book of Joel. You have to give me a second to get there. Hosea, Joel, Amos. Okay. Um, let's look in the second chapter. 
uh, of the book of Joel, and <clears throat> I'll just read two or three uh, verses here, which will help help lay a foundation for what I'm saying. And, and number one, remember, Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and said, this is that that was spoken of the prophet Joel. So he was, he was showing this is the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. And so we know that's what this book's talking about is the day of Pentecost and uh, the Lord coming <clears throat> on the day of Pentecost and, and, and in that church in a, in a divine order or a second heaven condition. So let me start here in the second verse. It says, blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh for it is nigh at hand. Let me say something to you about that. The day of the Lord and understanding the coming of the Lord, the day of the Lord cometh. Jesus is coming is not like certainly not like the religious world thinks. I'm talking about Christianity for the most part. They think Jesus is coming like at the snap of a finger. And what you need to understand is Jesus came already in the early church. He came in that church. He harvested that church. He first came in the flesh, which he doesn't need to do again. He, his, his sacrifice for sin only needed to be given once. But he came on the day of Pentecost he came uh, and they were baptized in the Holy Ghost and then he was in a ministry, in the operation of a ministry in a full sevenfold light and a complete manifestation and demonstration of his spirit to harvest that world. It was the end of the Gentile world and Jesus was there to make up a portion of his bride out of the Jewish world and also to bring salvation and the new, through the new covenant and the overcoming message. And so uh, Jesus is coming, is a, it's really a 45 year ordeal. He came on the day of Pentecost and his coming was through those apostles and that ministry and through those people manifesting himself completely in a full manifestation of the spirit and the truth of the word of God, a sevenfold light. That sevenfold light means that it was a complete understanding of the word of God. They didn't lack any understanding. Down here, we're still working on uh, restoring all of the truth and restoring the church to a point of a sevenfold light and a, um, a complete full manifestation of God, which is a second heaven condition. Uh, and let me go back now. I read the first verse, blow you the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain, let all the inhabitants of their temple for the day of the Lord cometh for it is nigh at hand, a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. There hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. That verse alone is a great inspiration gives me great inspiration and the reason it does is because Jesus was coming in that early church on the day of Pentecost and remaining through that 45 year period but he said there's this people there's never been a people like them and neither shall there be any more like them even to the years of many generations that that indicates that there will be a people, but it'd be many generations, which is us, the Gentile restored church in the end of the Gentile world that would be a church like that early church. And so he said, 
uh, verse 3 says, a fire devours before them. That's judgment. And behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall dis escape them. So before them, they were going in back into the garden of Eden. That's what, they, that's what was before them, is they were going back into a sinless second heaven condition, garden of Eden or a paradise, however you want to, those allegories are there for us to see. And then he said, behind them is a desolate wilderness. That's the falling away of the church and nothing shall escape them. In other words, they judged that world in the end of the Jewish age. And so <clears throat> uh, I'm just using that scripture to show that when Adam, when Adam was in the garden, and he was in uh, that paradise and, and he was in a second heaven condition. Adam sinned <clears throat> knowingly, Paul said. Uh, and so, <clears throat> but Eve was deceived. And so uh, he had a full knowledge of what he was doing. And that's why when he did it, there was an eternal judgment applied Death was applied and death came on all men because Adam <clears throat> was born of God. Uh, how did Paul say it? He said the first man, Adam, was a living soul and the second Adam was a quickening spirit. Well, Adam, the first man, Adam, was made of dust. He was made a human and God breathed into his nostrils, nostrils and he became a living soul. And so, <clears throat> but the second Adam, which was Jesus, he was a picture. Adam was a picture of him who was to come. And so uh, Jesus uh, uh, he was a quickening spirit. He, in other words, he, Jesus didn't have to breathe, breathe into his nostril for him to get life. When Jesus was, uh, when he was taken from heaven, reduced to a seed and placed in Mary's womb, he was a live spirit. He was alive uh, in God. He was, God was his father. He was, he was, he didn't have to be made alive. He was already alive. He was a quickening spirit. And, um, uh, and so uh, Adam, when, when God made him, he was made a live soul and he was alive unto God. He was God's child. Uh, God was his father, but he, he disobeyed and he, he didn't, how did uh, Paul say it in Romans that uh, say, uh, sin was in the world from Adam to Moses. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, nevertheless, uh, death did reign from Adam to Moses, but uh, sin wasn't imputed until the law was given. What that means, that word imputed means counted. Uh, God didn't, in a general way, he didn't specifically specify every sin and everything that was wrong, but uh, we were born. Here's the point. We weren't born of God. We were born of Adam. God, the Lord made Adam, but Adam, after his fall, he made you and I. He made the offspring of fallen humanity. We weren't born of God. That's why Jesus said, to Nicodemus, you must be born again. It's important that you be born again of God's spirit and uh, the, the overcoming life is necessary because when you're born of God, you're born just a babe. You're, you're just born again of God's nature, but your mind, your, your mind is... Uh, trained up from a child in the way of sinful flesh. 
fallen nature of Adam. That's why Paul said also in the book of Romans, he said, be ye, uh, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove that which is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So uh, you, your, your mind's going to have to be transformed, be, you know, renewed in the spirit of your mind. Your, your mind lines up with the Adamic nature, the fallen nature of man. All of this that's going on in the world uh, of, of fallen man is, uh, you know, we, we grow up in that. And uh, our mind takes on the mindset of the world without even trying. But your mind will have to be renewed, and, but it will, you, it will take a new birth. It will take being born again of God's spirit. So uh, that's why when you come to the Lord, uh, you, might, you might turn with me to the fourth chapter of the book of Romans. I might just read a little bit there. We might read, read that. In fact, we may read that chapter because it talks about, you know, how that Abraham righteousness was imputed to him and through faith. And that's how we are the children of Abraham is through faith, righteousness can be imputed or again, that word counted. God count you and I righteous. When we accept Jesus as our savior and we're born again of his spirit and we begin this road of pilgrimage leading up leading us to maturity, transforming our mind, learning the ways of God and learning. And it takes a certain spirituality. It takes, you know, it takes uh, God training you up spiritually. You, you can't receive this with the carnal mind. It, it takes the spirit of God to touch it. For you to have faith, you can't have faith without God helping you to have faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, and it takes the spirit of God to touch your ears. The spirit of God will have to touch you in your hearing to cause faith to rise in your heart where you can believe what the word of God that you're hearing. And so you're, uh, you're gonna have to grow. How did uh, Paul say it in Hebrews, the fifth chapter, he said, uh, uh, he, he was talking about uh, strong meat belongeth to those that are of full age, but milk belongs to babes. See, so there's a difference in being a full age in God and a babe in Christ. You can, you know, when you come into this, you're just a babe and you're gonna first, and, and he's using that allegory of milk and strong meat to show that when you're a babe in Christ, you can't understand the, the detailed or difficult parts of the word of God that, that uh, you're gonna need to understand as you get, as you develop and mature in the things of God. But first you'll start off like a child does with milk, that the just scriptures concerning salvation and, and uh, walking with the Lord and receiving the Holy Ghost and repenting of your sins and trying to get your mind girded up to receive the things of God and learning how to yield to the Spirit of God when God deals with your life, learning how to receive the Word of God. Um, that's all uh, milk of babes. And uh, we're all babes in Christ. By the way, let me just say that. Uh, sometimes brethren want to, um, I've heard brethren try to use in Christ as being perfect, and that's not so. Uh, you're in Christ when you're born again. You're, you are in Christ's kingdom. You're born of, Christ, of the Lord, and you can be a babe in Christ, but you know, 
uh, and Christ is in you. But of course, we it, it is Christ in you, the hope of glory, to, for him to fully develop and become a part in your life. So uh, <clears throat> uh, look in the fourth chapter of the book of, of Romans. Uh, I just want to say a little bit about there about uh, imputed righteousness. Uh, let's start in the first verse. It said, what shall we say then that, and if everyone would turn to the fourth chapter of, of Romans, first verse, what shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. That word counted means the same thing, excuse me, as being as having it imputed. Now, in other words, God counted him righteous. He wasn't righteous, but God counted him righteous because of faith. Now to him that worketh is the reward, uh, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, uh, saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. He's quoting Psalms 32, one and two there. And by the way, it, there is no greater blessing than to have your, uh, have the Lord not impute sin, not count for God to count you righteous. This is a marvelous thing that God will, because of the work of Christ and what he did for you and I, that God can take all of your sins and forgive them all and never bring them up against you again in judgment. Now, I will say this, you know, um, God don't forget. And, uh, you and I are the same way. You, if someone sins against you, you you need to have forgiveness in your heart. You've got to forgive. You can't not become a slave to someone that has done you wrong, and you've got to get to a place that you can forgive. I've I've used the the saying uh, uh, concerning my father. My father is no longer alive, so I use this now. Uh, uh, when my father was in sin and wasn't living right, uh, my, my mother and father divorced. They did finally remarry. My dad did finally get back to the Lord before he died, which I'm very thankful of. But my, my dad did a lot of things that was very hurtful as, to me as a child. And I had bitterness in my heart at, at a young, much younger age. But did you know God was able to help me to realize that there was sin that was in his life and the fallen nature that caused him to see things the way he saw them and do the things that he did. And you know, a man can even be doing what he thinks is right and not be right. But he was, I'm talking about things he was doing wrong and he knew they were wrong. But God helped me to understand that he was in a fallen nature and sin had such a hold on his life that he couldn't get free of it. And, you know, he just couldn't bring himself to a really true repentance. He wasn't able to find that place in God for many years. But God was able to help me to just chalk it up to the sin nature and understand my daddy loved me. He cared about me. I know that. And... Uh, and I, he, he really didn't want to hurt me, but he couldn't help himself in some areas. And I was able to, I'm able to, God was able to help me understand that that, that was what was in my father's life and that 
God let me let that go and forgive him and, you know, uh, realize that, you know, it, it, my dad's heart, he liked to do what everything that's right. Sometimes it's hard to know everything that's right as you grow and develop in God. And, and so, you know, uh, I just was able to count it a wash and just say, you know, I loved my dad. I know he loved me and we had some problems. I had some hurts and, uh, you know, but I was able to forgive all of that and I don't have anything in my heart against him today and I didn't have anything against him when he died. And I'm thankful that God helped me to get to that place because it's terrible to be a servant or a slave to, uh, you know, when people do things against you and hurt you. Uh, it can affect you to a point that you're a servant or a slave to that and you, you know, because of the hurt, what does the Bible say that, you know, a, 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 a soul offended is harder to be one than a strong city. It's like someone that puts bars all the way around their life. Nobody can hardly get used to, you know, get close to you. I had that, I talked to my wife one time about that, Sister Smith. Uh, you know, when you come up as a pastor, you, you make mistakes and People make mistakes, and you, whether y'all know this or not, I'll let you in on a little secret if you've never been a pastor or been close to a pastor. Pastors' families get hurt because people expect them. They live in a glass house, and people expect them to be perfect almost, and any mistake they had will be brought up against them at times, and even their family and their kids, and and so it's easy to, it's easy to get hurt. And I told my wife one time, I said, drop your guard. Just drop it. Just let it go. Uh, don't hold up a shield. Let people get close to you. She said, I don't want to get hurt again. I said, if you can get hurt, you need to be hurt. And I know that doesn't sound right. It don't even sound good. But what I'm saying by that is, is that if you, if, if someone can hurt you, and they can do things to you that can hurt you. But, you know, those are things that that causes you to develop in God, learning how to, to have really true forgiveness and turn vengeance over to the Lord. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. To get to a place where you can, you know, you can love God's people and you can forgive no matter what you go through that you can, you know, it will, it will, it will be a trial. You will learn, uh, you'll learn uh, patience through your trial, having to wait on the Lord and learning how to develop the right kind of spirit and how to respond correctly. And then uh, let patience have its perfect work. You know, let it, let it work in you because it works experience. As you go through these things, you're going to get experience. Um, you, you're, you know, and, and that's going to develop. Waiting on God, learning how to, to respond. Uh, Brother Ray Leninger, before he died, he had a saying. He used to say, uh, he, he used to say, learn how to don't he'd say don't react to to, to uh, a situation but learn how to respond i heard a minister one time spend an hour in a minister's meeting trying to explain to him to react and respond meant the same thing but they weren't getting what he was saying you know he was saying you can react in the flesh if he if he'd have said it different they'd have got it i'm sure but what he meant was as if you react in the flesh instead of respond in the spirit of God in the teachings and the good word of God uh, you know and that's what he was trying to get across to the people don't don't react in the flesh to situations that come come up in your life or come against you anyway so um, uh, let me let me go on just just a little bit here in the fourth chapter of, of Romans. Um, blessed, I'll read the eighth verse again. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. 
cometh this blessing then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? No, not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness, of the faith. Notice that the circumcision was in the flesh that he that God gave him as a sign or a seal. It was a seal of righteousness of the faith which he had yet he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they believe not, they, uh, I'm sorry, uh, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. And the father of circumcision to them that are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had yet, which, which he had being yet uncircumcised. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void. The promise made of none effect because the law worketh wrath. Of where, uh, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I've made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which are not uh, as though they were, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. You believe that today? You believe in overcoming and, and uh, in the body of Christ and the rest restoration of uh, that, the restored church and the making up of the bride? So you have to be fully persuaded that he that made this promise to us is able to perform it. Sometimes you think, well, wow, when's this ever gonna happen? I'm, I'm fully persuaded, saints, that he's able to perform it and it will happen. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not imputed for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom shall whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus from the, from the dead. So I'm just showing you that uh, God God actually the righteous line was before Abraham and there was no law and they believed they had faith and they were counted righteousness for their faith. And uh, it, it was not just for Abraham, but it was for anyone that had faith in God. And uh, of course, God did set up the law so that sin would abound and grace, uh, when grace came, it would much more abound. Sin made sin more, more exceedingly sinful, Paul said. And so um, uh, God 
God imputed righteousness there. Now, the reason I brought this up is because you and I have righteousness imputed to us. You're counted righteousness because of the work of Christ. But you're not righteous, not until you get this finished work of full maturity and develop into a full age. And that's what we're working on, saints. And that's why it's necessary to overcome sin and be made perfect. Uh, that word perfect just means, means fully mature, fully grown, full age. And it's necessary for you and I to come to a place that we put off this old man, Paul called it, and put on the new man. Uh, and, we, and, and it's our mind. See, your mind, your mind, uh, your mind is in, in sync with the fallen nature of Adam until you're born again. And once you're born of God, then your mind has to be renewed. You have to learn how, how we're right, what, what righteousness is. And it, it, it has to be through faith in Jesus Christ, the work that he done and seeing that he came here and was the example. And that for us to develop, we're, we, God has imputed or counted us righteous until this finished work is wrought in us. I would like to be like the Apostle Paul when I could say, I finished my race. I fought a good fight. I finished. There is therefore laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And not for me only, but for them also who love his appearing. That's not just talking about Jesus coming in, in the final advent of him making up his bride. It's talking about Jesus coming in your life and mine. See, you're, it is every man in his own order. Turn with me to uh, 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. Um. And uh, the, we'll start in uh, the twentieth verse says, "But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits, first fruits of them that slept." That word there, "slept," means dead, died of them that died. He became the first fruits. Well, he wasn't the first one that ever resurrected from the dead. There were people in the Old Testament, Elijah resurrected. Uh, there were people resurrected out of the graves, you know, when the bones of the prophet was thrown in, Elisha, his, he resurrected this uh, young man in his ministry. Uh, you know, Lazarus, that was, Christ was, they were still under the law when Jesus resurrected him from the dead. But this is talking about he was the first fruits of them that resurrected or of them that slept. That's talking about the first fruits that resurrected unto life everlasting, life eternal. He was, he was the first person to ever, from a hum, human being, to die and resurrect unto life and never have death work in him anymore. For, he says in verse uh, 21, for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, but every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Remember when I told you about his coming, Jesus is coming. He, he, he came in a his coming was a 45 year period of coming to the early church. And he's gonna come in the latter house uh, in the same way, he's, he's coming, it's called the day of the Lord and it's a span of time that he's coming in harvest, to harvest the church and people will, will overcome in their own order. See, uh, Philip, 
you know, we feel like Philip overcame and was caught up into heaven under life. We feel like different ones in the Old Testament made the bride, but it was every man in his own order. There's this scripture in 1 John that says, uh, brother, now are we the sons of God. And we can all say that. I'm born of God. I'm his child. But we know not what we shall be, see. <clears throat> but when he appeareth, we shall be like him. Well, Jesus could appear to me right now and that wouldn't make me like him. It wouldn't make me an overcomer either. If he just physically appeared to me, wanted to talk to me or whatever. But when he appears in my life, when I am developed to the fullness of the stature of the man Christ Jesus, when I be, I will, then I will see him as he is. I will know him, uh, you know, when, when I finally in my order of God working in my life. See, I, I say this quite often that this is my testimony, what I'm going through and what God is directing in your life is your testimony. It's like a, it's like a fingerprint. No two people have the same one. No two people have the same testimony either. We're all working out our salvation with fear and trembling, if you will. And as this, all of this is going on today, I'm, I'm just going to tell you, saints, and as a matter of fact, I don't know what to tell you <laughs> about this coronavirus deal. There is, there's so much confusion about it. Um, you know, in many ways, it seems like that it's blown out of proportion. It's a big hype. In other ways, it's, it, you know, it, there, there's a lot of fear uh, attached to it. Uh, the way that we are all responding in fear, the way our government is having us respond, the media all in fear, and then there's all of this other uh, that's being created by this fear that's causing people not to trust the government, the media, and all that's taking place. The only thing I can say to you right now is be still and wait on the Lord and put your trust in him because he is the only one you can absolutely, completely trust. The Lord will get us through this. And, uh, you know, I think that that uh, the Lord's not finished yet. I can, I definitely know that. We are not yet in any place that we're in the end of the world. There's many things that has to transpire yet. And there's many things that will happen. So just hold steady. God's hands on his people. He's not gonna do anything that he's not gonna reveal it first to his prophets. And God will give you, we'll have answers for this. We're just having to be still and by faith, walk with God and try to get the mindset of the Lord for all of this, for the body of Christ. And so I just, I want you all to hold on, hold on to the Lord and hold your faith. Don't lose faith. God uh, his hand is on us. He's not forgotten us and he's not caught off guard. God is absolutely, as a matter of fact, he's in control. He's absolutely in control. And whatever he's allowing to happen right now worldwide, I do believe that the Lord may be getting things in position. Uh, he may be allowing things to happen. He may have even put it in the mind of 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 men uh, in, in world leadership. You know, God may be getting the world ready uh, and uh, getting them positioned to where he can uh, bring about his judgment. Look, this world is evil. This world has not turned to God. This world has turned away from God. And God is going to judge. He's going to judge the world and he's going to gather his righteous out of it and he, he, he may force us. I'm talking about the people of God. He may force us to have to 
uh, get closer to him and, and rely on him more and act on our trust and our faith. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I started this off talking about why it's important to overcome sin, why it's necessary. Number one, if you don't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you need to begin to seek God for it because you cannot overcome the Adamic fallen nature of man. It takes a born again experience and that's the birth of the Spirit of God, which is the Holy Ghost birth. And so you've got to have that new man, that new nature to develop. I said, your mind lines up with the old Adamic nature when you come to God. But once you're born again and God begins to deal with your mind, begins to get renewed and it starts slowly lining up with the new man, the nature of God. And before long, when God's finished with you, your mind will re be renewed and your mind will line up with the new man, the nature of God and the Adamic nature will not have a mind or a vehicle to operate in and it will cease to operate, it'll cease to exist. It will die, mortify the deeds of the flesh through the spirit. The spirit of God will lead you, direct you, and guide you, and help you develop and renew your mind. And and, and I, don't get me wrong, this is not a, you can't do this with the power of the mind. It's God, the word of God, and the spirit of God working in your life that empowers your thinking, causes you to understand how God thinks, what's righteous and what's not righteous. He's counted you righteous, while you're developing true righteousness and holiness. So uh, God's working that in all of us, and it is a journey. It's a progressive work of the Lord. Keep serving him. You're his child, and he loves you, and he will see you through. He's going to help the church. Lift up your eyes to the hills from whence cometh your help. Hallelujah. Look up, saints. Don't look down. Don't be in despair. Have faith in the Lord. The Lord knows you, who you are. Um, somebody sent me a song uh, today that said, He knows your name. I love that song. He knows right where you are at. He knows what your name is. Sometimes when I... Uh, when I first began to realize that, you know, I used to believe that I was eternal. <laughs> I was going to live forever somewhere. That's what I used to believe. The religion taught me that. When I really began to believe in second death and understood that you could, there was an eternal judgment. And I, I began to re realize that without God, I'm lost. I'm forever lost. I used to go to bed and I'd say, Jesus, my name is Mick Smith. Here's my address. Here's my phone number, by the way. I don't expect you to call me on a natural phone, but I just want you to know who I am. I want you to know where I live. I want you to be aware of me and I want to be aware of you. Well, I know the Lord is aware of me. I know I'm his child, but you know, when it comes to the reality of me needing to know the Lord and know that he knew me. Oh, what a blessed thing in life to know that God loves his children. Listen to what the psalmist said. Blessed are the, are the death, blessed in the eyes of the Lord are the death of his saints. See, if you're a saint, that word saint means you're holy. Back in Spanish, they don't have a word, separate word for holy and saint. It's just santo, which means holy. Hi, Brother Calderon. I remember uh, what, one, something that blessed me years ago was when we was in a service many years ago. Brother Calderon in the Dominican Republic began to sing a little chorus, santo, santo, santo. 
uh, he began to sing that little chorus. Uh, my heart, mi corazón, sabe decir santo. Hallelujah. Jehová, uh, my, my soul understands the Lord God. And so he, that it's just a blessed thing to know that God knows you. God loves you. He cares about you and he is not going to fail you. If you put your faith and your confidence in you, remember this verse concerning Abraham, and you can apply it to yourself, where it says that um, Abraham was persuaded that he that started this work in him was able to perform it. You and I to believe that. What God has started in your heart, if you'll serve him, if you'll live a dedicated life and follow the Lord and be obedient to what he's shown you. You know, and let me just say this. There's a lot of people, I've talked about this in the past, that's been hurt. There's people that's, you know, that uh, they've lost there's people that's been hurt even in the body of Christ and they're out of the body of Christ today. Don't, those people don't need to give up and no one needs to give up on them. God loves his children and he'll do everything he can to save his children. And uh, he's able, he's able to finish this work in us. So just, Keep holding on to God. If you'll sincerely, with a dedicated way, hold on to God and serve him in a true dedication and faith, I promise you God will lead you and he'll take you exactly, exactly where he wants you to be and he'll finish and perform the work that he started in you in its finished work. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, it's just good again to be with you and, and uh, be able to say a few words. I always get lifted up when I'm talking about the things of God. I appreciate, you know, all of God's people and uh, appreciate the people here in, in, in Little Rock, Arkansas, the Dominican Republic, and all over in the body of Jesus Christ. Let's go with God. Let's trust him. Don't let these things shake you. Remember when Elijah was crossing Jordan with Elijah and a, a chariot, a fiery chariot of horses ran right at both of them and separated them. And right at that moment, Elijah was caught up into heaven. And what Elijah had told Elisha was, he said, if you see me when I'm caught up, you'll have what you're asking for. And what he was asking for was a, a double portion, which is the heir. It's the heir, firstborn's portion uh, of inheritance. And, and here this chariot ran right at both of them. And, and Elisha could have got his eyes off of Elijah because he was caught up right in that moment. But he was not distracted by the fiery chariot of horses. His eyes was on Elijah. And what that's a picture of is, is that that's a picture of seeing what it took for the early church and for this restored church to finish their work and be caught up and made part of the bride for a person not to take their focus off of that and get distracted with all the other things that's going on in life, especially right now. Don't get distracted with everything. I know you have to deal with it, but don't let it distract you to the point that your eyes are not on this great calling and the great work of God that's taking place in the earth today and your calling in it. God bless your hearts. I'll talk to you next Thursday night at seven o'clock. 
Those in the Dominican Republic, I'm working and I may have it set up by then to have uh, a live broadcast to the people in the Dominican Republic with Brother Green giving me an interpretation on live broadcast. I will be letting you know as soon as we get that set up. Hi, Sister Henderson. God bless your hearts. Good to see you on here. Um, anyway, um, pray for us. Pray for the needs of the church. Pray for the Dominican Republic as well as the other missionary works. They are suffering. They're suffering. In the Dominican Republic right now, they cannot leave their homes. At 5 o'clock in the evening, they have to be home. And if they leave, they'll be arrested. Uh, and their economy is in very bad shape. And I'm trying to, and I want to thank everyone that's mailed in offerings. It's helped us. I'm trying to help those in the Dominican Republic as much as possible. So God bless your hearts. Bless you for your, your giving and your help. Until next time, you pray for me and I'll pray for you. God bless you and good night. In Jesus' name, amen.